I'm Aaron Hayden, and this is Dragon Hearts. Well, welcome to Dragon Heart. I am your host, Che Long. And I am joined by Rex and commentators, Neil Williams, Bill Long, and Disney's very own Mark Griffiths. How are you all, guys? That's the best Mickey Mouse I can do. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm I'm in a, a state of my regular post-Christmas <coughs> confusion uh, because the snow has been falling, and I therefore am eager to get a snow day and a day off work, but also eager for it to clear up by the weekend so I can have football to watch. So <laughs> I'm in my regular state of hypocrisy. Uh, just quickly, lads, are you a fan of the snow? Because for me personally, I love it. as I've got older, I hate it. I hate the sludge that comes after it and that you're always walking around with wet feet. I do work on a building site, so that's probably another reason why I don't enjoy work in the snow. No, I, I I love it, guys. I I love the snow. Hence why I go skiing. So uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of snow here as well, and I struggle to get home tonight. But uh, hence why I'm a bit late. Neil, photography, skiing, pig farming. You're a man of many, many talents skills. and a Wrexham fan as well. You know, <laughs> yeah, quadruple <laughs> threat. <laughs> I, I really like the snow I don't like it when it then freezes and turns into that mad crunchy snow because that's that's uncalled for but you know when the snow is falling and you can look out of the window in the darkness and, and imagine generations past looking upon such a, a, a similar tranquil wintry idyll I like to carry out a tradition which my family has done for many generations where I I just go out and I knock on a random neighbor's door. And then when they answer, I drag them out into the garden and I push, rub, rub their face in the snow just to establish dominance to the rest of the street. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I like the snow. That's how, <laughs> it's, it's how it goes down in Summerhill or wherever you, wherever you live. <laughs> Never uh, lived in Summerhill. I'm a high town oh, boy, born and bred. <laughs> you see a dog oh, yeah. in high well, town, it's a tourist. I see a dog. <laughs> just, just a very quick one. Does anybody have any snow, Sorry. snow based Rex and FC stories of a game you've watched where it's been snowing or I, I've got one that um that well you, you two would have been at this as well, probably the West Ham game in the FA yeah. Cup. Yep. That's one of my earlier memories of watching Wrexham because I did tend to only go to the, the big games back then and I had a um because because my dad's a brummy, I had an Aston Villa hat, and it was the only hat I actually had. So they made me turn the. It was like a, it was like a dark blue and a dark red. So it wasn't proper claret and blue. They made me turn it inside out because they didn't want me stand. My mum and dad didn't want me standing on the cop with, you know, like a football badge with those colours on, which would have been, West Ham. Rightfully so, I think. Oh, oh Rocky, yeah. Rocky's joining us. Oh, <laughs> high quality cast podcast interface. Ah. Oh. Well. <laughs> This has been yeah. a cracking podcast so far. I, I remember when uh, well, it's about 2006 season, uh, it was snowing. We were playing Scunthorpe, I think, and Matt Jones scored a, a late winner. That's, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we've got other things to talk about. We've got a heroic <laughs> performance of uh, the young lads against Ultra Gun. We've got a few things to talk about that. We're going to be talking about <laughs> do we need a, a sign a striker? Yeah, your thoughts on that, any, all, all our thoughts on that, and then any of the bits and bobs, really. So, yeah, this is Dragon Hearts. Hi, guys, I'm Dominic Vose, and uh, this is Dragon Heart. Well, Ultra Gun, uh, it was a very interesting game, I think. But, Bill, it was a great run out for um, the lads who were injured and looking for game time a great experience for youth wasn't it bill yeah it was it was perfect in a, in a lot of ways for them really it was it you know the for for some of those lads to get a chance and i've seen like phil parkinson talking about earlier in the week that um it, he was desperate for scott butler to get some game time just because he's impressed in the reserve games and in training and you know uh, jake bickerstaff Look fantastic against Scunthorpe, and he looked fantastic again against Ultringham. Yeah, overall, you know those those lads have have staked the claim, or or at least 
um, put their names in the hat if we have a little bit of an injury crisis. Yeah, of course. Because staff, I definitely put on the bench for the first team because he, he was, I would say, he was a class mm-hmm. above the rest playing on against Altrincham. He's got pace. He's big lad. He's got skill. Yeah, I, I would put him on the bench, maybe in, in case of Dolby. In some cases, you know, given run out, he, he's going to be a promising player. Mm, okay, but yeah, I, I'd have to say I agree. He looked a real talent, but. At the start of the game, Mark, it, it was all ultra gun, wasn't it, for the first 10 minutes? And I, I did sit there watching it on TV thinking this could be a really, really long night. Uh, yeah, they, they were very impressive, ultra gun. I must remember they're on one of the longest unbeaten runs in the division. And I thought they started very well. And we looked like what we were, a team that doesn't tend to play together regularly. And they were sort of feeling their way into the game and, it could have gone away from us, I thought, in that first, well, 20 minutes, I would say, really. I, I thought that they were dominant. Uh, we rolled our luck a bit. There was some good defending on occasions, uh, and there was some poor finishing on occasions. So, yeah, we, it, it was it was not pretty from our point of view, but, you know, that's part of football, isn't it? Sometimes when you start badly, can you recover from it? Can you get through that bad spell without getting too badly damaged and the game going completely out of your reach? And we achieved that. And then I said, part of the way through, after about 22, 23 minutes, we suddenly came to life. And I, I thought that was admirable. We, we talk about the first team having a good mentality and, and getting through tough parts of the game. Well, that was good because the, they could have folded then. Uh, but instead, we we dug in and they showed they, what they were made of. Yeah, to achieve that with a side that doesn't play football as often at this sort of level was really impressive, wasn't it, Neil? you, you got to remember we were playing a very strong yeah. ultra to- side. totally agree with what Mark said to me. For the first 20 minutes we went in it, you know, we looked like, as Mark said, a team that had been thrown together. But in theory, they, have they been playing quite a bit in the reserve team? I'm not too sure. Mm. Uh, and then, as Mark said, you know, after 20-odd minutes, they just came to, to life and they, they seemed to gel. They seemed to know we, where each other was. And the passes seemed to start sticking, you know. Was, we were lucky to, to only go one nil down. We, you know, Leighton made a few good saves, a few blocks, uh, and and poor finishing by Altrick. And we could have run away in the first twenty odd minutes, um, but no, Wrexham dug in, uh, picked up the game, and, and and played far far better for, you know, a good period of the the rest of the first half, and I would say maybe the first twenty minutes of the second half, um, and we looked comfortable two one. Um, and then it got squeaky bum time in the last 15, 20 minutes where Altrigan were battering us and battering us and inevitably that equaliser came. Um, but again, after that, I think we had a chance to, to, to nick one, you know, to take the lead again. But uh, to be fair, you know, a 2-2 draw was a fair result maybe. Um, and do we care that we're out of the trophy? Not really for me anyway. Yeah, I think... It was the ideal situation, you know, for everyone involved. You know, Ultringham got through. It's a big, big occasion for them, you know. And the young lads got some minutes. The the the, the, the players who are going to be pushing for the first team got some minutes. You know, someone like Rob Layton, who's just come back from injury, it was the perfect game for him, wasn't it, Bill, to come back to and get some first um, team time. Yeah, it was a, a, a competitive game that, that had, you know, repercussions, which I think uh, regardless of whether we want to be in the trophy or not, which I, I do agree with Neil, it was almost like the, you, you know, we don't really care about being in the trophy, uh, but there's still that sort of element of risk being involved without it being serious. It was almost perfect for for him and for Reese Hall Johnson and a few of us to, to get a bit of game time and, and experience that sort of uh, situation, really. Um you know the trophy. The trophy is really, really not important to us this year. And I've seen a few of opposition fans rinsing us for for getting knocked out, and also rinsing us for being oh, we don't care anyway. Which is, I, I get why it comes across as sore loser, but we really don't care. We've been in the final three times. We've won it once. Last year was a, a let's be honest. A, a, as much as I enjoyed it, in the grand scheme of of when you look at the history books, it was a you know. You know humongous waste of time. It was good for the documentary, but statistically it was a humongous waste of time because it 
possibly cost us a promotion challenge in the end, and uh, we didn't win it. Uh, and we we just don't we just don't need that. We were in the reserve. We've got the reserve league now for those players to get more game time. But fair dues, they give it they give it a crack, and and we're out. So yeah. Well, I feel that let's... there's one. Oh, sorry. No, no, you go, you go, Max. Sorry. Say, the, the, uh, to me, I, you see that I think there's one drawback really to the FA Trophy, which is after this round, you start postponing matches to play in the FA Trophy. And that that that's a major issue. We haven't got many mid- midweek slots <laughs> left. Um, I don't go along with most Wrexham fans on the other reasons to devalue the FA Trophy, though, because it is a trophy. It is a day at Wembley. Um, I don't. I know that the North Ferriby game and the Bromley game, and let's be honest, the Newport game have really soured our image of Wembley as an exciting day out. So, <laughs> totally get that. Um, but the way to address that is to go there again and win. Uh, I think <laughs> you know what I mean. It's uh, you know you don't think oh I don't want to go to Wembley now because if you're never going to go to Wembley again, you're not going to win much. So I don't know. I I I, I like the idea of us winning, except that. It could clog up our fixture path and fixture path. That sounded terribly sort of twenty first century management speak, didn't it? Yeah, we're going to have a a fixture path to our our ultimate uh, synergy. Um, but the fact that North County have gone out and Chesterfield have gone out means they don't have that issue. Maybe it's good that we don't as well. But I, yeah, I always feel a little bit sad when we when we lose a game, even if we didn't lose it. Yeah. I think that's oh, it I... for me, Mark. It's if it was like the um. The what's it called, Papa John's or whatever they call it now, the football <laughs> league, league trophy, uh, and it was all midweek until right towards the what's it? Is it's only the final that's that's uh, on a weekend, isn't it? If yeah. it was like if it was like that, and and it wasn't going to clash with games, I wouldn't be bothered. It is purely yeah. because of the the fixture mm. congestion that would come from it. Yeah, because yeah. let's be honest, we got we got a big squad. Let's give them games. If it was a midweek, yeah. I agree completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, and I, I think. With us be, still being in the FA Cup as well, mm. and the FA Trophy yeah. on top of that would just yeah. be distraction after distraction after distraction. You know, we do want to be winning the league this year. Well, we need to win the league this mm. year. We don't want to be going through the playoffs again. So, yeah. yeah. So the reserve side got a really good run out last Friday. And for me, Mark, how valuable is this reserve league, the reserve side, to the progression of the squad? enormously so. Although, if I can just go back to your point about the FA Cup, I mean, that's true, isn't it? Because there's only, there's a limited number of midweek slots left available to us so we have to rearrange games. And so, you know, when we play Man City in the fifth round of the FA Cup, we'd have to rearrange (laughs) the game on that day. Then when we play Liverpool in the sixth round of the (laughs) FA Cup, we'd have to rearrange the game on that day. And then when (coughs) we play... um, Aston Villa? No, that's not possible anymore. Sorry, lads. Uh, <laughs> when we play, oh, I don't know, some other bums, Man United in the semi-final. So that's three more games <laughs> we're going to have to rearrange. The final, of course, won't clash with any matches. But yeah, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but to go the back to what you said, yeah. Say? The double's still on. Exactly, and exactly. Of course, <laughs> remember, if we win the FA Cup, we'll have Thursday games to be thinking about, won't we, next season? Oh, hey, that's true. Mm. Is that is that Europa <laughs> or a conference? I can't remember now. It's Europa League, isn't it, if you win the FA Cup? Because wouldn't it be ironic if we got out of the National League but remained in the conference? Hey. <laughs> a, a specialist <laughs> joke for people who've spent well, the last 15 years there. Thank you very much I, for I, week. I, I'm looking forward to Hadrick split away anyway. Oh, it's uh, well, I tell you what. We'd you know, have to you a few preliminary <laughs> rounds to play them, wouldn't we? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, th- this this reserve league and team, Mark, it's it's really impressive, isn't it? Oh, massively. Uh, we have got so much more squad depth than last season, which I think is what ultimately did for us. So I'm not totally sure the trophy run did for us last year. You could hmm. spin it the other way and say if we didn't get the chance to really demoralise Stockport in the semi-finals of the trophy, that they might not have had that end-of-season wobble, so it might have helped us, ironically, in a way. But, yeah, I mean, just having a chance, not only to get these young players playing, but and integrate them with more experienced players, but also, as we've seen really clearly with Harry Lennon, for example, getting players back to fitness by actually getting them on the pitch, and Lainton, 
Yeah, it's invaluable. I still thought Leanton looked a little lacking in match sharpness. But yeah. the thing is, we can address that now. We can, we can use him in reserve games, whereas, you know, last season, if he'd been in that situation, unlucky. It would be like Dibble, just have to get thrown in. You've not played a game for months or weeks, but you have to play, so get in there. Um, but yeah, I, I, mm. I think it's it's fantastic. Um, it's a player that stood out for me as well, and has stood out since he's come to us, was Scott Butler. I thought he looked very, very yeah. solid at the back. Um, and, you know, a player that, and we've got a fair bit of cover in depth at the back, but, you know, Butler looked like he could do a job at our level, to me. Yeah, he, he's young and he, he's playing in the middle of two, um, you know, more experienced centre halves of first team football. He, he did really impress me as well. Well, what was your thoughts on him, Bill? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, looked very assured. Um, you, you can tell he's got that sort of quality coming from being in. Swansea's academy for after after being with us for a little bit. How did he look in person, Neil? Because I always find like players that you know it's always one one thing looking at him on TV, isn't it? But it's another to see him in, in live in person. Yeah, he's, he's a big unit, you know. He's a, he's a big lad, and and he had a good game in in the centre defence, you know, with with Clowith on one side, and you had Hall Johnson there on the wing as well. But yeah, I mean, for all these players on the fringe of the first team, I think it's you know it's great for them to have the run out and. And have some game time, you know. I think it's ludicrous that the Paul Johnson has had all the flack off the fans for missing that penalty. It's, you know, never wear a Wrexham shirt again. It's crazy, you know. They they all need that 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 game time. They all put in a shift on uh, on Friday night, and you know it's important for for them, them periphery players to to be ready to step in if we need them in the first team because we've got so many matches coming up now. I think in in February there's there's loads of matches in February. We're like playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, all mm. all through the, the month. So, uh, you know, they never know when they're going to be called on and they need to be match fitness to to keep our winning streak in the league to go. And, you know, that's the important thing for me. And a lot of the fans this season is promotion. Are people yeah. saying that about Hall Johnson? That's dreadful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's scandalous. <laughs> crazy, crazy, yeah. Well, yeah. I think they need the Reds, Reds, to be honest they with do. you. I do. Quite apart yeah. from the fact that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you can criticise people for things they do deliberately, but when you want to achieve something and don't quite make it... I, I, Just it, missing the penalty, you know? Yeah. But also, I mean, all right, you put it over the bar. But, I, I mean, whenever you see penalties go over the bar, it always looks spectacular and looks like you've really skied it. But generally, they go over by an inch or two. I mean, still off target. I mean, yeah, OK, it's not successful, but I think people need to have a good look at themselves. I always think that yeah. Chris Waddle one, you know, the famous over the bar penalty in Italia ninety, you know, where people make jokes about oh it's still going now and all that stuff. Um, it's not that when you look at it again, it's not that far over. <laughs> it's just that he's, you know, he's not quite got it right. And as I said but, in the commentary of the game, um, the stats are very very clear, and it's why Bickerstaff was so incredibly unlucky. If you if you put your penalty in the top fifty percent of the goal. The, the the statistics are something crazy like ninety six percent chance it's a goal because the keeper it's difficult to dive high in those mm -hmm. situations. So, firstly, what a save by Oliver Byrne from Bickerstaff, yeah. and I think that was the decisive moment because let's not forget Altrincham put a penalty <laughs> over the bar as well. The decisive moment was a moment of brilliance by their goalkeeper, not either of our players missing anything. Um, and secondly, what is Hall Johnson trying to do? take the unsavable <coughs> We love it when it works. And we say, oh, well done, mate. Wow, you're cool. Well, yeah, he didn't quite get it right. Do we, we, he shouldn't crucify him for that. That's absurd, isn't it? I know. It's crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. It's not the end. Of, it's not the end of the world, you know, <laughs> dropping out the FA Trophy. You know, it's not. <laughs> Some Wrexham fans just can't take losing at the moment, can they at all, you know? Uh, but yeah, I got, I got a quick question now for you, all of you guys. I don't know who wants to ask, ask first. I was, I was listening to uh, the Ben Foster podcast the other day, and he was talking about how valuable it was to not play youth game um, games for Stoke and to go on out on loan to the non-league teams and to us Wrexham, playing in front of crowds who were, you know, giving him abuse and what have you, or was invaluable experience. So. You look at someone like Butler or Bickerstaff, maybe not this season, but 
maybe in the summer, would you look to maybe offload them to the National League North side or a National League side if we get promoted to get that valuable experience of playing in front of a proper crowd? It's a good For question. Me, like... Sorry, go on. No, no, go on, go on. I'll just say it's a good question. I, it's a tough one. Yeah, I, I would say for me, no. I, I I think those two would be on the periphery of being on the bench. Um, you know, we've only got three three out and out strikers at the moment. If one of them get injured, you know, Bickerstaff would be on the bench. Um, but I, I was talking more beyond this season, so say going into next season. I I think they they're good enough quality <laughs> players though to be playing our first team now. But yeah. Yeah. I, I would loan out, you know, some of the younger squad to go out on loan to get first team football in a, in a, you know, in in the non league, in in the national league, just so they get match experience. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with you. Send them out on loan, but I, I think that you know, two or three really good quality ones in in that reserve team, you know, knocking on the door of the first team. I, I'd say no, you know, keep it at the club in case we have, you know, suspensions, major injuries, or whatever. Weirdly, I actually think if we stay in the National League, you you put them out on loan, and if we go to the Football League, we keep them. And I, I there's a bit of thought process behind it, right? We the bench is increased to seven when from five if you go up. So in League Two, you can have seven players on the bench, and they're more likely to be able to sit on the bench. And if we're cruising to a three nil against somebody, they can come on and get a bit of experience. Whereas if we if we stay in the National League. You've got Kluwer for head of Butler, probably, you know, unless Butler goes on a, on a real tear. And you've got Dalby ahead of Bickerstaff. And even if one of Palmer or, or Mullin went because we stayed in the National League, you'd imagine we'd go and spend a bit of money and get another <laughs> top quality striker to replace them. So I think if we go up, they, they've got a bit more of an opportunity to be involved in that, in that, uh, uh, that squad on a match day. That is uh, such a, a a fascinating twist on it. I think I think you got a real point there because it, they're stuck in that classic situation because we've got money. That you know, if if we need another striker, that for example, or a centre back, the temptation's got to be to spend some money and bring a very good player in. But then, where does that leave players like Bickerstaff? Uh, and Butler? They just pushed another rung down. But then, by the same token, if they go out on loan. Well, I mean, Big Star's been out on loan three times already. Anyway, um, even though he's younger than Butler, so I don't know. It's you know, see- if you go out on loan, you, you're right down the bottom of the pecking order. Then aren't you? The, you can't play that season but- or that half season, and then other people might get the chance to step in ahead of you. I don't know. I think the thing you say about I- youth football, it's like academies, isn't it? You, you see academy yeah. players who are great technical players, but they're playing everything in the under-21s, under-23s, when you put them up against, as you say, grown men, they it tends to be they got nice technique, but they haven't got that physicality. Not always true, but true often enough for it should be a problem. And a lot of people criticise the youth system for those reasons. And I'm just sort of thinking when Dean Saunders first came in, his first tactic, or strategy rather, was to bring in loads of those young players on loan or signed from... Uh, Premier League academies on the the basis that they're better footballers than National League footballers, and in terms of technique, yeah, they were. But a lot of them didn't <laughs> have the physicality, and a lot of them made good starts and then got worn down. I mean, I could, I mean, just think rattle off players who started well and then faded. John Brown, remember them, the quick lads from Cardiff, yeah, like yeah. a sensation at first, didn't he? Nathan Wolf, first couple of games, brilliant. Uh, there were loads of them like that. And the only one for me that really sustained his levels all the time on loan was Ryan Flynn, the lad from Liverpool who went on to play in Scotland. He looked like a class player and was consistently so. Um, and then you think of players who signed from clubs like from purely from academies. Caelan Bailey Nichols tore it up, didn't he? Supposedly in the Premier League in the 21s. Yeah. Well, you know, Anthony Spiru, Norwich's next big thing. You know, and more spooky than pooky. I would say, that, off the top of my head, that wasn't bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that, that that's the issue. And, and Butler's maybe had more of that sort of education. But he does look physically equipped, as Neil said, to deal with senior football. And Clueth didn't, well, no, I beg your pardon, Clueth had a short loan, which was very successful, didn't he? But I don't know, it's hard but, to say, isn't it? 
But I, 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 I think there, there would be real value in seeing a Butler, for example, going down to, say, a Kidderminster, a biggish side in a league below, with proper crowds and having regular week-in, week-out football to deal with that pressure. Because, you know, first-team football is a very different thing. And for him to be chucked into the, the deep end of what is the race ball <laughs> at the moment would be a big, tall ask. Uh, do you think it's different because of their position as well? I know this might sound stupid, but you yeah. need strikers to be scoring goals. Um, I think the staff is at the moment. True, but... He scored against Scunthorpe, he scored against Altrincham the other night. He knows where the back of the net is, you know, and he, he doesn't get pushed off the ball easy either. Oh, I'm massively impressed with him, and he's really come on a lot, I think, hasn't he, over the last six months or so, since we last saw him in the pre-seasons. There's just a bit of me thinks, as a manager, I'll tell you what managers don't like, getting sacked. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's common in all of them. It's common in their breed. And um, I, I just sort of think, you know, a manager faced with bringing a young lad through or bringing in somebody because they've got the money that they know will score them goals is liable to buy in the new striker. Whereas with centre-backs, you might be slightly more willing as part of a unit to bring them through. I might be talking nonsense, though. I, I'm willing to accept that. <coughs> it, it's a fascinating question, though, isn't it? There's pros and cons to either situation, isn't there, really? But that would be my personal preference to see, especially Butler. As I said, Bickerstaff has been out, out on loans. Um, it'd be interesting to see Butler go to a big side in the National League North. So I've got another question for you all, guys. It's been banged around a lot on Twitter, a lot on social media. Do you think we need another striker? Do you think we need well, to sign another striker? Shall we chat about it after the break? Yeah, should we do the break first then? We'll be talking about that after the break. <laughs> I'm just looking at how long's left and thinking, eek! <laughs> Sorry. How long have we got left? Uh, one minute forty five. I'm Harry Lennon, and this is Dragon Heart. Do we need another striker? It's, it's, it seems to be the top of the question all over Twitter a lot. But so, Bill, I'll, I'll let you go first. What's your thoughts on it? Need, no, want, yes. I know that's a really uh, sort of wishy-washy answer, but I'd love us to go and get someone really pacey who can change the game, uh, you know, when they've faced Mullen and, and Palmer for or, or Dalby for 90-odd for minutes. You, you get into that last last 10 if you need an equaliser or you need a goal to go in. Someone with a bit of pace, someone who can come and, and, and be that catalyst. Or maybe someone who's close to that, Mullin style because I think when you play Dalby and Palmer together, um, it doesn't maybe quite work just because they're quite similar players. I mean, I quite I'd actually quite like to see them play together because the the brief times they have, it's been a bit hit and miss. And maybe if they had a run together, it'd be a bit different. But um, I don't think we need one though. I think if 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 someone put a gun to your head and said, "Do do Wrexham need a striker? We don't need one." Because I think Jake Bickerstaff can come in in a pinch, but it, it would be it would be the w one position really that I think I'd like us to to go and get some backup in. Neil, I would go along the same lines with Bill because I think Bickerstaff is is ready to go and step into maybe Palmer's boots or Derby or Mullins' boots. Um, I'd like to see him have a game get with uh, Mullin on the pitch and see what happens there, but. Yeah, yeah. As I say, everybody's after saying we need a new, a new striker. But uh, for me, do I upset the apple, apple cart and bring somebody in, maybe on more wages or whatever? And then they've got to learn the team. Where obviously Bickerstaff is playing week in week out or training with them. You know, new players got to come in and, and learn how we play. And so for me personally, I'd say no. Um, maybe a midfielder might be more important. Mm. I think, yes, we need to bring another striker in. But I have to admit that my view of this has changed a little 
not enough for me to change my mind. I still think we should bring in a striker. But the last week and a half have made me ponder it a bit more deeply. But Dolby's had one hell of a week, didn't he? I mean, he started against Coventry. He did really well. Goal and an assist. Ran himself into the ground. He was brilliant. Then he came off the bench against Bromley. And it wasn't for long, but he made a difference, didn't he? He was really lively and creative, and I thought he looked great. And I also felt that the, there was a free song of excitement in the crowd when he was doing certain things. They were The fans at the tech end were really enjoying him. And then he's had a good game against Altrincham. Let's not forget, Altrincham picks a full-strength team. Altrincham were unbeaten in eight before that match. And Dolby was dominating their centre-backs in the air. Um and then as well as Neil says, I mean, Dolby did well. Bigger staff was terrific. He ran him ragged. And he's had two chances this season. And he's been excellent in both of them. And, and that's where I I question whether I'm right saying we need another striker. Because, yeah, like you say, Bigger staff does look good. Um, and I would be happy to see him given opportunities. But, oh, we just live in this weird heightened reality now, don't we? Don't you think? We've got to go up this season. That's the sort of feeling. Well, push comes to shove. If we can bring in, somehow convince a player of proven goal-scoring pedigree who's going to add genuine quality to the squad and convince him that he should come and try and fight Mullen and Palmer for the starting spots, I'd want us to do that. I wouldn't <laughs> want us to bring a striker in just for the sake of it. Although I do think four strikers, and then if someone gets injured, we're looking a bit thin. Does is a little bit worrying, but I don't know. Would you really turn down a bloke who's willing to fight for a place and and will score off the bench consistently and will, if needed, you know, heaven forbid, one of the front two get injured for a long time, will step in and score at a similar rate. You know, like I said, this heightened reality, everything feels so important. If we were scrapping for a playoff place in League Two, I'd be more happy to see a player you know, coming through uh, and getting a chance. But if we've got a position now to, to buy in a player of real quality, I still, I'd still do it. Is that bad? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree with you. Uh, you I think... think you want to sit on a... Sorry, go on, guys. Well, I just think that the National League is that cutthroat <laughs> that we do need that extra layer. But it's just, who do you bring in? Who, who, who's going to want to come in? Yeah. To the right price as well, because we don't want to be paying over the odds. January's desperate times, isn't it? And everyone seems to be wanting to put an extra zero on the salary when it comes to Wrexham at the moment. So I say yes, only for the right price and if it's the right character. I agree. I, I, I would put those conditions onto it, yeah. But also you got to think, is that kind of player going to want to come and sit on the bench and just keep the bench warm, knowing... You know, we've got Palmer and Mullen on the field up front. So, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult for Parkinson to persuade a player to come to Wrexham just to warm the bench. Yeah. I I, I agree, but I think Palmer's looked quite leggy recently. Um, He's carrying an injury, though, isn't he? He is carrying an injury, so I think it's maybe time for Dalby to And his dog has been very poorly, is not he? His dog's passed away, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's, you know, Mullen could get a red card or could get an injury himself at some point in the season. So I do think we do need that extra little bit of quality because do we really want to be relying on a young lad like Jake Bickerstaff, who is doing excellent things in reserve games and FA Trophy games, but it's a hell of a lot of pressure playing in front of 10,000 at the race course. Maybe we need that someone who's a bit more experienced. You but know, as we Mark, tried early, early on the I've season, said, you know, playing at the front. Sorry, go on. We, we tried Elliot Lee up front early on the season. That didn't quite work. So I think everyone was thinking he would be the backup striker. But yeah, I think it has to be someone who's right right for all parties, not is, is coming in for the right reasons. Is there any other positions you'd think about signing up as well? No, exactly. The, the, yeah. only, the only area that gives me a little bit of concern is left wing back, not because I don't like the players who play at left wing back, but because they keep picking up injuries. You know, Mendy, I think, is a class act, but, you know, he's had an injury, he's come back, he's broken down again. 
Um, McFadgen is a very good player. Um, he's injured at the moment. Hopefully, he'll be fit for the Maiden a uh, Maidstone game. Um, you know, to be fair, I, I, you can't blame McFadgen for getting done by a Brom, Bromley player who should have been sent off. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, that bothers me a, a little bit. McFadgen, since he's come to us, has been pretty good avoiding injuries, but did have a record before he came to us of getting injured. So it, that makes me just look a little bit and think, okay. Uh, do we need someone who can cover there? But I don't know. Um, With McLinden, McLinden's been doing a pretty yeah. good job at left wing back. Would you want him to be regularly there, though? He played. I like, I like McLinden, but defending is not really his thing, is it? Yeah, I agree. But he played a, a lot of crucial games last season. True. Yeah. He played quite well. Uh, I. I, I, I I don't think it's a priority, but I'd rather have extra cover there. Unless Bryce Susanna is uh, very close to coming back. Oh, that's true. They, they, yeah. they were set, well, oh, gosh. Well, that's a, that's a thing, isn't it? You're quite right. Theoretically, we could have four left wing backs as well because Susanna can play there. And Parkinson was saying <laughs> that he's close to being, coming back. But he also said a fourth player who could, that's a posh play at left wing back, Jordan Davis is close to coming back. But now we're hearing... Yeah. That he, he came back to training and had another knock and is out for a couple of months. Although I'm not sure how much of that is actually confirmed by anybody. So take it with a pinch of salt. But Parkinson said both he and Ozana were close to, to coming back. So then you don't really need to sign a left wing back then, really, because Ozana can play either side, can he? No, but I filled three minutes of the show and I think that's essentially what I mean. <laughs> 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 but but yeah it, it's I, I don't think I've ever been a Wrexham fan you know with this amount you know watching this side with so much depth from every position Bill we're really spoiled for choice aren't we oh massively um, and I think you know it's and I the, the, the question is do we need cover not do we need a you know what I mean? Like we've been yeah. in previous seasons, it's been, do we need a striker? Yes, we do need a striker. Do we need a centre midfielder? Yes, we need a centre midfielder. Now we're just thinking about cover or if not cover, just alternative options that aren't necessarily uh, essential, but would enhance the squad a little bit. I mean, it's similar with centre-back. It, we've got Sonny Cliff, Toza, Hayden, Kluwerf, Lennon, and, and you, I suppose you could say Butler as well. But Butler's got that same thing that we've got with Bickerstaff. Of if we did have a bit of an injury crisis, do you want to rely on Butler for a quarter, the last quarter of the season, or whatever it would be? So maybe centre back is a position. Would you would you look at centre back? No, I, I, not, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Be, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be in a rush for it. But it's. I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily in a rush for a striker either. I think that you. You could shop now in January when all the football league clubs are, are looking to offload their troublemakers or their their high paid players who uh, they don't want sitting on their bench anymore, or or people that just have ambitions to sort of move on and make a bit more money. Because let's be realistic, anybody who's coming from the football league to us will say it's a fantastic project, but money is definitely on their mind when they come down. It's it's just a just a simple fact of life, you know. So. Wish it's it's like a weird. This window is a really weird one for us to shop in. We could skip January, wait until February or March, and and see how we we're, we're looking. And if it comes to March, like Stockport did, they just went out and got three players, didn't they? Took a couple on loan, was it, and and one permanent. Yeah. Yeah. And and that just that little bit of extra energy at that point in the season just give them that extra push to to take over us because we really did look leggy at the back end of last season. So. Um, yeah, and I, I yeah. think this, this is why this year I'm a, a lot more confident in us as a squad compared to what I was like last season. Because I think, you know, last season Stockport were at the second year of their project. They had a proper squad built over two seasons with a lot more depth than what we had, hence why they went up in the end, because, you know, they were the second year of their project. We are now at our second year. We have a real depth now. And I don't think the likes of Notts County and the likes of Chesterfield can really, you know, Notts County can have arguably as good, if not a better starting eleven than us. But our depth throughout a whole season 
you know, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, isn't it? It's going to really serve us for the end of the season. It's going to be, going to be exciting. Now, here's a question for all three of you. If you could bring back a striker from previous Wrexham sides, no matter when, and it's got to be, it can't be just, I don't know, Dixon McNeil. It's got to be someone who would fit the the role, if, if you know what I mean. So someone who's good off the bench or a different type of striker, who would you pick? I'll go first as you wait. I'd pick Hector Sam because he's fast. He'd come on. He's a different type of striker to what we have. Scored a lot of goals off the bench. Uh, Lee Jones would fit into that category as well, of course. He's yeah. got a lot of goals off the bench. A good impact player coming on. How about as a slightly left field call because he didn't come off the bench for us. But in this situation, a player like Matt Derbyshire. Good Ooh, quality. He was, uh, he was a good really player. Finisher yeah. fast. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, the problem would be that in reality, he'd want to come to a player of his quality would want to come to us as first choice striker. But then that leaves us with a question, what is the whole point of having cover? I mean, I think maybe I'm being a bit unfair saying I want another striker. Because the whole point of a cover players are not quite as good as the players of the team. How do you cover for Mullen? If you cover for Mullen by bringing in another striker and of his quality, well, that, that bloke plays as well. So, you know, I, by definition, cover strikers aren't I, the ones in the first team. I think I've got the potentially the perfect suggestion then. He knows the league, mm-hmm. actually went up as, as part of a front four that... Uh, Involved him being rotated, Andy Mangan. Oh, that's a good when, it, when it, I, I, on a personal level, maybe not every Wrexham players, uh, Wrexham fans' favourite with him <laughs> going to Fleetwood, but he played second fiddle to Vardy. Uh, was also, you know, in a rotation of about three or four strikers that they had that were really good. And uh, as as much as he left under a bit of a, a dark cloud at Wrexham, he, he was quality. To be fair to him, yeah. That's a good call. Neil? Didn't he come back to Wrexham, though, Andy Mangan, and it didn't work out for him? No. I can't remember. No, no. no. So I got mixed up. He wishes. But I was going to say Gary Bennett, and I thought a bit more about it, and I thought Stevie Buxton, which we spoke about a few weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> coming <laughs> off the bench, and, you, you know, a little terrier, well, you know, will snap on the heels of a, of their defence, and, and, and he was quick, and he was only a little lad, and, yeah, he'd have been my player to come in. Um. I was completely clueless about him until you two educated me. So I'm saying, yeah, like I know, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Steve Buxton was the ultimate um, angry wasp trapped in an upturned beer glass in a <laughs> but of substitute. Just buzzing around, <laughs> desperate to hurt somebody or score. He was great. He, he was great fun. <laughs> he had a real edge about him, didn't he, Neil? He certainly did. And, you know, he was. No bigger than a midge, was he? He was a, he yes. was a small little lad, but uh, yeah, oh, he had some pace and some yeah. tenacity. That's it, a pace and tenacity. That's exactly, exactly it. That's exactly what he has. Um, I like that. I like that call. I think that's good. He certainly winds centre backs up. You can imagine National League centre backs getting in, coming on. They're tiring a bit. It's twenty minutes left, and he would really be getting at them. Yeah. <laughs> he would really upset them. There'd be a couple of angry red cards. For the other side over the course of a season, I reckon. <laughs> He'd probably get a couple as well, to be fair. We've all gone for a bit of a wild card pick, haven't we? Rather than your basic picks, a lot of people would say, uh, like Lee Trundle or Andy Morrell, but they are the obvious picks, aren't they? They, they? they wouldn't be the ones coming off the bench, though they would be happy to be on the bench at all, would they? No. So, Carl Connolly would be another one. <laughs> Wanugate, he's quick. Wanugate, he's quick yeah. players coming on against tiring defenders, really. Yeah. And that's good, to play, good to play in a way as well. Andy Morell in his second stint actually probably possibly fills what I said about Mangan in that he, you know, he used to be able to come up, was quite happy to play on the bench when he was player manager, wasn't he? So yeah. maybe maybe perfectly fills that role. Oh, I've got a good one. Cezovich. <laughs> he would have been good. A lot of lot of pace. To come on to change the game. Mm. I think that's what we look, that's, that's what yeah. we want. Uh, a pacey striker who mm. would knack her out uh big clogging National League defenders. How about the young Chris Armstrong when he was a young lad with us? 
very, very fast. Really very fast. Player. Yeah, um, cracking player. He used to come on as a sub and terrify teams. Uh, and he didn't have end product at first, but you know, Flynn kept working with him and eventually he could a bit like Bickerstaff, he, he started looking a lot more rounded and got the move pretty quickly up to divisions. But he was very fast, wasn't he, Neil? He got into really he was fast and strong and got into great attacking positions. And even though it it became a bit of a thing that for a long time he hadn't scored that first goal, you always felt, yeah, but he will. Once he starts scoring, he'll be all right because he just keeps getting in these great positions with his pace and his his strength. Yeah, definitely. So you know, he was a, he was a classy player, as you say. He took a while to get going, but then he was consistently a good goal scorer for us. So, uh, so yeah. And as a target, Neil Roberts. Oh, sorry, Neil Roberts would have been a good one as well. Yeah, anyway, sorry. good for holding the ball. That. Again, you know, if you got a quick lad coming on and him holding the ball up, or if we're winning and you bring him on, really valuable, I would say. <laughs> um, in terms of holding the ball up as well, um, I just thought of someone, I've forgotten who it was. Oh, well. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'll come back. Oh! No. Um, Andy <laughs> Priest, that's who it was. I always thought Andy Priest was terribly underrated. And my dad and I used to get quite narked at the way that, you know, big striker, good touch on him as well. He was much more than just a target man, but he was big and he could handle himself in the air. And we always thought he was consistently good up front and used to do a hell of a lot of work um, for Gary Worthington who was up front with him. And he tended to get in the end of things and score the goals. And we always felt that Priest didn't quite get the credit he deserved and then Stockport County took him and went up to the divisions with him with him playing with Kevin Francis who was a big freakish six foot seven striker um, and Priest became a, a good sort of player at championship level and I, I thought he was a, a, a smashing un, unselfish striker so you know bringing him on if you want to bring a big bloke on later on I think he would be effective and he was quite quick not super quick, but he was mobile and he was good on, he had a good left foot as well. So he was a good all round striker. And you can also yeah. bring back Ian Edwards as well. He was virtually on the same mould. Ian Edwards, proper proper target man he was, wasn't he? Yeah. So Ian Edwards. Uh, are we all going to agree agree on one? I think Matt, uh, Matt uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Jones. He's had enough history best, lessons from Neil and I, hasn't he? He's like, yeah, I, I yeah, think, whatever. Think, okay. It's starting I think Lee to become Jones is a good shout. So it was starting to become just a let's name strike as we like sort of a section, wasn't it? <laughs> all, right, all right then, pal. All right then. All right, for one of my bedtime stories. Uncle Griff's bedtime stories. Um. John Paskin, <coughs> in the 92-93 season, Neil, back me up here, was very much super sub. You had Watkin and Bennett, and they were great. And then you had Paskin in reserve, and he was really, really good at coming off the bench and having and him act. He was known as Super Johnny Paskin. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was again, big bloke, about, well, I'm assuming about 6'2", something like that, but was yeah. quick and just had those attributes to come off the bench. But then Bennett gets injured halfway through the season. And I, I remember there was all sorts of doom and gloom. People saying he's going to be out for like months. And everyone was horrified, not least because we were playing one of our promotion rivals, Barnett, away. And we've been in excellent form. We went to Barnett. Paskin's playing up front. And that's what I was saying before. The, uh, you know, you cover a good cover player. But does that make them a good player to start if your main man's injured? And Paskin... Played up front, didn't play very well, really. To be fair, the whole team didn't play well. We lost 3-1. And then, miraculously, Bennett was back the next match, which I could never understand, but we were all relieved. You know what I mean? It's a, <laughs> players are good cover players, good off the bench, good for the odd game in the team. But if you get a long-term injury, maybe you have to really look then for someone you can buy. And And that's... And that's the worry this season if one of Ollie Palmer or Mullen get a long term injury, then we are then we will be kicking ourselves if we haven't signed someone this. No, this you window, I'll be on to Palmer. As you say, he did a cracking job of commentary. He was fantastic. Yeah. Oh no, I, I, I agree, but if it's Mullen who gets injured, 
then I, as much as Dalby and Palmer are good, <coughs> they're two target men up front, aren't they? And I know they're different style target men, but I haven't really seen met. I, I I don't I can't really see in that working as effective, in my opinion. Here's another little twist to buzz on it. What if we have to do what we do against did against Bromley? And go super attacking, so we bring off a centre back and bring on a striker, yeah. and you've yeah. got two strikers. You've got Dolby and Palmer up front, and Mullen just off them. Um, mm. What do we do? We need another striker in that situation, so that if if we feel like, but one of those players hasn't played very well, we can also just do a like for like swap. You know, this mythical new super striker for Mullen. We will yeah. all see by the end of the month, won't we? Well, no, because we've got no transfer windows. Sorry? we we got no transfer window, have we? So we can bring players. Oh, right. Sorry, yeah, yeah. But apart from that, that was a beautiful way to round the segment off, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> after, uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, after this, we're going to be talking about how crucial the next two weeks are going to be. I'm Liam McClendon, and this is Dragon Heart. Well, two vital weeks in the National League title race. And I think, you know, with us having Maidstone on Saturday, there's another game that Wrexham fans will definitely be tuning into right after the Wrexham game. And that's the Notts County Chesterfield game, which I think we'll all be keeping our eye on. But, Mark, it's a vital two weeks, isn't it, in this title race? Oh, the, the, yeah. I, I think the next, next Saturday, going through to the Saturday after is massive, even though we don't play the Saturday after. We've got two games in that time, and they're both away, but they are both against teams in the bottom four. Uh, I'm not taking anything for granted, but if we're going to try and win the league in a season where both sides are really hardly dropping points, we need to get six points out of those matches. Um, We've already beaten them at home, and we need to do it away. (coughs) And then the point is that and bearing in mind that the title is in our grasp in terms of we've got games in hand and we're only three points behind, the games that Chesterfield and Notts County play are only realistic rivals, for me, look a bit nasty. They've got to drop points, at least one of those, because, like you said, that that match in the evening on Saturday is Chesterfield at home to Notts County. Um, So there's going to be points dropped there by one or both of them. Then the next Saturday, Notts County are away to Solly Hull. Now yeah. I know we played really well against Solly Hull, but they're a good team. And they've just taken Tom Whelan, who I think is a good midfielder on loan from Chesterfield. And he's a decent signing, I think, to replace Stora. Because Stora's uh, dropped down in divisions now, isn't he? He's, he's left them. Um, to Nuneaton, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh that's a, Notts County have got two nasty away games on the <laughs> Chesterfield. Uh, on that Tuesday, uh, are playing at home to Altrincham. But like I said, Altrincham are on a long unbeaten run. So they're, they're no mugs. <clears throat> so but that, there's some potential for Chesterfield to drop points and Notts County on the midweek. And then the Saturday after, we won't be playing because we're playing Sheffield United. Notts County will be playing. No, they won't. Big one. Oh, they will. Okay, at home to Halifax. Fair enough. But by then, hopefully... If things have gone our way and they've dropped points, they'll be under real pressure in that game. And not only that, uh, Chesterfield, if they come through the FA Cup, which at the time of recording we don't know, are away to Barnet, who are doing well. And if Chesterfield do come through, well, their fixture congestion is really starting to build up. So the next two weeks, I think, are big. If we come out in the next two weeks having got six points, I think <laughs> that league table will look fantastic for us, and I think we'll be in a real position to drive on and try to open up a gap between the other, us and the other two. So, so, starting with Saturday, guys, what do you guys see, what do you think is the ideal result? Uh, draw. For the, you know, with us winning, you say draw, but if we win and Chesterfield lose, then it does really put the pressure on them, <laughs> doesn't it? I want but to. I don't think Chef, Sorry. I don't think Notts County will lose because their away form is really, really good in all mm. I'd like Chesterfield to win. So would I. I, yeah, I see them same. as the lesser threat. <laughs> Chesterfield, uh, you know, credit to them. I think they're a good <laughs> and 
they they look better than Notts County when you know they both beat us. Notts County game could have gone either way. Chesterfield game, I thought they were very good. So I'm not belittling Chesterfield, but I Notts County are a greater threat to us, I think. And if not, the more Notts County drop points, the better for us. So I would like Chesterfield to win that game. I'm confident we'll finish above them as long as we don't the wheels don't fall off us completely. And I don't see any reason <laughs> for good. Uh, Notts County are, 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 the, are the main threat to us, I think. Do you feel like, Mark, that this season it's kind of a roles reversed uh, Fleetwood Wrexham season, uh, <laughs> 98 point season? Because you look at, you look at, um, if you know, if you look at uh, Rex, if you look at Notts County, they, their first 11, they, they have some excellent players, don't they? And, deserve to be going up as well as us which is as well it makes this league so crazy it's the hardest league to get out of because there is it is only two one automatic um promotion place but not to count you're really really pushing us aren't they and they're a really class side uh yeah and it also reminds me of last season with us in the yeah. not stocks about the stockwell county position um i think we are in the box seat i think whatever the hell that means um I like my cliches. I don't like investigating where they came from. Um, I'm no Islamologist. Uh, I, they are. We are the better side. We are the woman in the stronger position, and I do expect us to finish the job. But you know, again, a good, really, really strong second team. Um, th- there seem to be genuine noises coming out of the football league that there may be three up next season, which would be wonderful. But I hope we leave that behind. I, I, I that's an irony I would enjoy, enjoy <clears throat> us being frustrated for fifteen years that there aren't three up, and then it gets brought in the year after we go up. You know, galling as it might sound, I'll take that because it means we go up. Look, I, I'm not a, an overly superstitious person, but Wales got <coughs> into the World Cup for the first time in however it was sixty odd years. The World Cup before it was expanded, so it would be typical if Wrexham then did a very similar thing. I like yeah. it. Nineteen sixty three, we got promoted. Nineteen ninety three, we got promoted. Two thousand and three, we got promoted. What does this year end in? A three. Promotion or a three, depending on. How <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've got to win our two away games first, though, guys. It's two yeah, warm. we have. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a long yeah. way down to Gateshead and Kent. Then we've got to go up to Gateshead on a Tuesday night. So, mm. yeah, they're both very winnable games. And the, the squad plays we've got, you know, we should win both those games. But uh, we said that about Wheelstone and we came away with a point. Um, so, yeah, we've got to we've got to win both those games, which I'm, I'm comfortable um, we will do. But, uh, you know, every game for against Wrexham is a big cup game for them. So, they all want to beat us. And, and you know, Maidstone have just got rid of their manager, haven't they? Uh, so there'll be that new manager bounce as well. So it, it'll be a, it, they're always tough away games in the National League because you know it's it's a lot harder for Wrexham to to play away games because we don't have that amazing atmosphere and that whole bounce that there is when we're playing in the race course, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, so, and and last, sorry, go on. And the yeah, there's, there's it, the atmosphere is is a really big thing for us, isn't it? And uh, our atmosphere can be as good as it as as anywhere away, but it's just you, you're always hampered a little bit by the size of the stadiums and the acoustics that uh, those little stands can sort of produce. I like when we went to Wheels and Che, like I think the atmosphere was actually bouncing, but it just didn't carry at all, did it, onto the pitch? Mm-hmm. And it does make a big difference. Yeah, I think about our, you know, our last two previous away g- games have been very good. You know, where um, Eastleigh and Solihull, I thought we performed really well, and uh, you know, all hope it continues uh, on Saturday. I'm hoping yeah, we're Rocky certainly doing it. The territory there, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> In the backside, <laughs> um, and those so of you watching, listening to the audio version, um, <laughs> you missed out on, on, on the delight of. Bill's cat <laughs> threatening to to spray him if he doesn't leave the show soon. <laughs> <laughs> and as for you, Che, but, uh, I think you need to ask some Southampton fans about that new manager bounce thing. Was it they lose uh, that seven in a row before they won on Saturday? Yeah, but they did. Yeah, they beat City though, didn't they last week? Yeah, that's right. And they, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, no, I I agree with that new manager bounce thing, but. <laughs> 
I agree, no, I agree with what you're saying to an extent, but you know, any any game's a dangerous game. You know, it's a it's it's going to be a t- tall order, not a tall order. It's th- there's still going to be tough tasks. You know, Maidstone and Gates said we shouldn't be looking past any side in this league. We've been here for too long to be thinking like that. You see rotation also, from us, bearing in mind that the two teams near the bottom and also the distances we'll have to travel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to Kent, exactly. Up to the northeast. And having respect so, for the opposition is a big thing as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So another in other really important news, the cops been demolished. Uh what did you guys think when you saw that? It just felt so surreal how quickly it's just gone down. It's just not there anymore. It's weird driving past it, isn't it? Just seeing nothing. Very strange. Well, there's going to be a lot more building, a lot more work to do, and a lot of new surroundings for Rexham fans to get their heads heads used to. But yeah, this has been a cracking podcast, lads. Um, I have been Shay Long, your host. This is Bill Long, Mark Griffiths, Neil Williams. Match day commentary on Saturday. Triple A this week, all that great stuff the media team do. This has been Dragon Hearts. I'm Luke Young, and this is Dragon Hearts. What about Rocky? And Rocky. Yeah.